It is Friday, April 1st. Final Four is tomorrow. You're watching Red on Q College Sports. Welcome back. Thanks for checking in with us again. Hope you're enjoying the content. Remember to like, subscribe. Uh, you're watching Red on Q College Sports. I'm your host, Tyson Quiller. Always welcome your feedback. We've got the email right on qcs at gmail.com. Uh, please feel free to share this content with anyone you think might find it interesting. We are now going into the final four starting tomorrow. Uh, but before we get into the tournament action, the big news that dropped last week, Memphis men's basketball was slapped with allegations of at least six NCAA violations. Head coach Penny Hardaway was the only specific individual named in these allegations. Now, there are four levels of NCAA uh, violations, with level one being the most severe. Uh, each of these allegations against Memphis basketball are a level one or a level two. Now, you might remember LSU's Will Wade uh, got fired just a few weeks ago uh, for five level one violations. You might also remember Arizona's Sean Miller was fired. Uh, last season, he had no, a total of nine level one violations. It's kind of unclear as to what the nature of these violations are at Memphis. They are described as severe breach of conduct and, quote, a lack of institutional control, head coach responsibility, and failure to monitor. So we will have to see how that all plays out. I think not a good sign if you are a Memphis basketball fan. Penny Hardaway might have gotten caught with his hand in the cookie jar. I, I don't know if it's specifically financial, providing finances to student athletes, because you do have NIL now at this point. So I'm kind of, like I said, it's kind of unclear as to what the nature of the violations are. Speaking, of, though, of a man I just named, Obviously, Xavier could not care less about NCAA violation as they have hired Sean Miller, the former Arizona head coach. <laughs> like I mentioned, I mean, he was under FBI investigation, NCAA investigation just a year ago. Xavier Xavier says, uh, you know, in, in you come. In you come. We'll see, uh, we'll see what happens there. Apparently, they only needed one year to marinate on that. Now, I, one thing I want to say, too, serious question. At what point do we start talking about Mark Few, the Gonzaga head coach, in the same way that we talk about John Calipari, about how they always have tremendous talent, they're always overrated, and then they underperform in the tournament? I mean, at least John Calipari has a national championship. Mark Few, I mean, a number one overall seed two tournaments in a row, and you didn't win either of those years. Now, with that being said, though, the team that knocked off Gonzaga was Arkansas. And I told you last episode, head coach Eric Musselman, he might be one of those guys that is coming up the next generation to replace Mike Krzyzewski, Jim Beheim, some of these old guard of college basketball uh, to carry the mantle. And what a fantastic job he has done. Back-to-back -back Elite Eight uh, appearances for his team. I think, he, you know, obviously the university recognized it. He got rewarded with a very healthy contract extension from Arkansas. The other really impressive win on Thursday was, in my opinion, Kelvin Sampson's Houston Cougars. They played exceptional defense, holding Arizona that was averaging 90 points per game to just 60. They did go on to lose, however, to Villanova in the Elite Eight in a game where they shot just 5% from the three-point line. But that was an aberration. I've got to tell you, I need to restate. Houston is here to stay until further notice. They are the beasts of the South. Them, and you could potentially argue Baylor. St. Peter's, how about it? The first 15 seed to make it to the Elite Eight, and now the clock is ticking, in my opinion, for Shaheen Holloway. Uh, he's going to get poached for a bigger job. Congrats to them, though. It's an incredible season. The Drame brothers, Dougie Fresh, Daryl Banks, and the Elmont, New York native, KC Nadefo. Boy, they really put on a show at this NCAA tournament. Super fun to watch. In other news, it's now official. In the last two seasons, the Big Ten has gotten 18 teams in to the NCAA tournament field, and only one of them has made the Elite Eight. Zero have made the Final Four. 
A Big Ten team has not won a national championship in 20 years. Can we please cool it on the giving nine spots to the Big Ten? Can we please cool it on the Big Ten earning three more spots than any other conference? Six more than the Pac-12, who had three teams in the Elite Eight last year. Three more than the ACC, who, who had three teams in the Elite Eight this year. Can we cool it on the Big Ten hype train? Okay, seven, maybe eight teams next year, not nine. Getting a little out of hand, getting a little ridiculous. A couple other points of interest. The small forward from Texas Tech, Terrence Shannon Jr., has entered the transfer portal, as well as their guard, Kevin McCullough, has declared for the NBA draft. Mark Adams, I thought, did a great job with Texas Tech in his first year after Chris Beard left. But Texas Tech is going to look completely different next year. So it'll be interesting to see how they're able to adapt for that. So too will LSU. Four players, four players that played this year, have entered the transfer portal. Chief among them is their point guard, Xavier Pinson, uh, and LSU's super sophomore, Tari Eason, who was maybe their best player of the year. He has entered the transfer portal as well. In addition, on March 23rd, the Colorado State kind of do everything forward, uh, power forward, Deshaun Thomas entered the transfer portal. You know, with this Colorado State team, you were really hoping, because all of them are basically sophomores and juniors, you were hoping you'd get a lot of these guys back. As long as you get Roddy and Isaiah Stevens back, I think you're still in good shape. But Deshaun Thomas would have been a good piece to hang on to. He's not gone. He hasn't, you know, signed with a new program yet. He's just in the transfer portal. He may just be testing the waters, but a point of interest. Also, the small forward, Max Agbonpolo out of USC, uh, and EJ Liddell uh, have both declared for the NBA draft. So now, after all of that chaos, we end up with a final four of Kansas, Villanova, Duke, and North Carolina. Four of the bluest of the Blue Bloods. This is how it happens. This is why I, I, I understand I got a number of things wrong when I did my bracket prediction. But what I did get right and what I told you is these first and second round upsets are fun but irrelevant to the points you're going to get in your bracket game. The points are more and more increasing as you move along in the rounds. Far more important to maintain your final four teams than to pick the right 15 over a 2 or 14 over a 3 upset. It is a truly blue blood final four at this point. Uh, and there's, in my opinion, no underdogs. I get that North Carolina is an eight seed. Eight is the lowest seed to ever win a national championship, but North Carolina is playing their best basketball of the season. I don't think there's any underdogs really at this point. They're all just, um, you know, the best team out of their region. So first at 4.09 p.m. on TBS tomorrow, two seed Villanova takes on one seed Kansas. Kansas is the early favorite here over uh, Villanova by four and a half points. Uh, they certainly have more talent than Villanova. But Jay Wright's bunch has the best defense in the Final Four remaining. That was really the interesting and fun part of that Villanova-Houston game. You had probably the two best defenses in the NCAA tournament playing each other at that point. I feel a little bit bad for Houston. I think maybe they could have beaten a Kansas uh, or maybe a North Carolina if they would have matched up with one of them. But they just ran into a juggernaut in Villanova. Uh, Jay, uh, Justin Moore who has been a major factor for Villanova, tore his Achilles and is out for the season. Like I said, the game tips off at 4.09 on TBS. I think that is a real factor, Justin Moore being out for Villanova. Uh, I think Kansas will probably get the win here in advance to the national championship. Then at 6.49 p.m. on TBS, I keep saying this to remind you, these games are not on CBS. They are on TBS. I don't know why, but... It's where they're broadcast at, just so you know when you're trying to watch the game this weekend. 649 on TBS. This, uh, these games, are, by the way, are being played in New Orleans at the Caesars Superdome. Uh, you have the 8-seed North Carolina taking on the 2-seed Duke. Again, don't let the seed fool you. Duke is the 2-seed. Carolina is the 8-seed. But these two teams played at Duke last game of the season. North Carolina throttled them. Throttled them. North Carolina is a completely different team than they were at the beginning of the year. Duke, however, is the four-point favorite coming into this game, Vegas odds. Uh, but I think it's kind of a total toss-up. Both teams are playing their best basketball of the season, like I mentioned. Don't sleep on the heels. 
Heber Davis, I think, is coach of the tournament so far. If Carolina wins, like I said, it would be it would tie the lowest seed to ever win the NCAA tournament. It would also be the first time a first-year head coach won the NCAA tournament since 1989. That, like I mentioned before, was Steve Fisher and that 89 Michigan Wolverine squad. Not the Fab Five squad. This was the team two years, about two years before the Fab Five, a year or two years before the Fab Five came along. Uh, that gets misconstrued quite a bit. The Fab Five never won a national championship. So, but uh, the, then on Monday evening, the national championship is also going to be broadcast on TBS. Now, we are obviously kind of winding down the college basketball season, and we are starting college football spring games this weekend as well. I was kind of looking through my email inbox, and i have gotten some questions, and so I wanted to address kind of some big picture, 30,000-foot view uh, topics that ha had been uh, asked of me about this upcoming college football season. So let's just go ahead and let's start right here with kind of what are the off-the-radar teams that I believe could surprise this upcoming season. First and foremost, I think you have to consider BYU. BYU had a great season two years ago. Then they lost somewhere in the ballpark of 70 to 80% of their production on both sides of the ball, and yet somehow still had a great season this year. They are one of the teams that I think could make a run at a top 10 finish. Jaron Hall returns a quarterback and is a real dangerous dual threat. Uh, he, does, he does have to limit the turnovers, though. He has a little bit of a pension of getting reckless with the ball. But you also return Tyler Algier, the third leading rusher in the country last year. Uh, he's back behind a very experienced O-line. Their schedule breaks down like I have on the screen here. Don't overlook South Florida. I think this will be a bounce back year for them. But back-to-back -back games against Power 5 teams that both of them played in their conference championship game last year. I think if they win those two games, they start 3-0, they're going to be up in the 15 range. I mean, that's, that's big-time clout to pull off those two wins especially the Oregon one on the road. Um, that Notre Dame game, you can see there, is at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas. That's going to be kind of a, a pretty cool showcase for BYU and Notre Dame. Depending on how things shake out, I think this could be a college game day matchup against Arkansas. If both of these teams are, and I think they could be at this point, undefeated, it could be a top 15 matchup in the country as BYU hosts Arkansas. Then we look further down the schedule. They have to win big early because uh, the back half of their season is really kind of pretty weak. Boise, hopefully, they're going to be hoping that Boise and Liberty are both undefeated by the time that they play them. I think you're going to probably see BYU get up in the rankings and then kind of slide as the season goes on. Even though they keep winning, they're not winning against really great teams. Uh, BYU does return 97% of its defensive production and 80% 80, 80 of its production on offense. If you are a BYU fan, this should be a very, very good se season upcoming for you. The next team I would say off the radar that can make a top 10 run is the aforementioned Arkansas. Their quarterback, KJ Jefferson, uh, just announced he is back off of a breakout season in 2021. As we look at their schedule here, Cincinnati, I think, is going to start the season off ranked. But they lost a ton on both sides of the ball. It's good for Arkansas. They're playing them out of the gate because if they played them week five or six, they probably wouldn't be ranked. Uh, as for South Carolina, uh, they made a lot of noise in the transfer portal. Remember, you got Spencer Rattler, also the big tight end, Austin Stogner coming in there. I think these are going to be looked at as two good wins to start the season off for Arkansas. You have that primetime matchup against Texas A&M at Dallas Cowboys Stadium, AT&T Stadium. And then that leads into a game hosting Alabama. That is a massive, difficult two-game stretch back-to-back. -back. But you do get Alabama at home. When you look at their schedule, only four true road games, Mississippi State, Auburn, Missouri, none of which had a winning conference record last year. And they get all of the three best teams in their division at home. I think this could shape up to be a surprising season for Arkansas. How about Kansas State? I think they could also make a run that might wind them up in the top 10. You look at their schedule here, they have a very easy first three, and we'll get a win over SEC team in Missouri. I mean, SEC by name only, Missouri but, uh, football is down quite a bit. But for Kansas State, Deuce Vaughn 
He's the best running back in the country, in my opinion. And you have incomes, uh, the Nebraska transfer, Adrian Martinez at quarterback. Now, he has been in battle. We're going to find out if that was because of him or because of Scott Frost. Uh, now that they have parted ways, it's kind of like the Tom Brady and the Bill Belichick situation. Looking down the schedule a bit, with all the transfer portal activity and Lincoln Riley leaving, I think Oklahoma's going to struggle a bit out of the gate. Uh, Iowa State is not the Iowa State of recent success. Brock Purdy, Brees Hall, and their big-time tight end, Charlie Kohler, are all gone. Uh, Oklahoma State and Texas you have at home before catching the reigning champs in Baylor on the road. I think there's good patches in here that Kansas State can really get on a roll, and they could probably be playing for a Big 12 championship game next year. And my final team that I think could really surprise uh, would be Fresno State, potentially make a run to the top 10. Uh, Jay Kaner is back. He is a player that just completely blew me away last year. He's back at quarterback for his senior season after passing for 4,000 yards and 33 touchdowns last season. This team just flat has weapons all over the field, returning three receivers who had more than 600 yards receiving last year. Kaner's favorite weapon, Jalen Cropper, Caught 11 touchdowns last year. He is back on the wing. You have two big, as we look at the schedule here, you have two big early season Pac-12 matchups. Uh, the, the Bulldogs lost by just seven at Oregon and one at UCLA last year. So they're no stranger to Pac-12 matchups. USC will still be trying to find their identity, I think, at this point, And their defense is just god-awful. That's the, that's the worst-kept secret ever. Nobody ever discusses it that USC's defense was atrocious last year. They have done very little to change it, but we're all looking at the glitz and glamour of Caleb Williams and uh, Mario Williams, Brennan Rice, Lincoln Riley. None of them play on defense. I'm just saying, UCLA hung a 60-burger on USC last year. So maybe, maybe pump the brakes on the USC fandom uh, getting out of control here. Fresno State is at Boise State on October 8th which is never easy. Uh, they got crushed by Boise at home last year, so motivation won't be a concern. They should probably be wanting some revenge there. Um, their only late season test, I think, is San Diego State at home on October 9th, uh, 29th. Uh, very similar to BYU's schedule. Really front-loaded. you got to win early, and you got to win impressively early because you're going to sort of slide down the stretch as you finish off your last four, Hawaii, UNLV, Nevada, and Wyoming. This is a team I think absolutely could go undefeated. Now, I do think Tennessee is on the rise, but their schedule is absolutely brutal. You have a top 15 Pittsburgh and number one Georgia on the road, and they play Alabama at home on October 15th. I think they'll lose all three, but could win the rest, and they'll finish somewhere between probably 7-5 and five and 9-3. and three. Houston is not really a factor. They could certainly go undefeated. I think that that's possible, but their schedule is just way too weak. Their big non-conference games are against the two worst teams in the Big 12. So now I want to turn kind of to the next question I was going to address. This is kind of not counting Georgia, Alabama, and Ohio State. Who are, your, who are the teams you think could make the playoff, the four-team college football playoff? So first, I'm going to say Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a team that I think could surprise and make a run at the playoff. Kenny Pickett is gone. Uh, the all-time passing leader at Pitt finished with almost 4,000 yards more than Dan Marino did at Pittsburgh. But in comes Keaton Slovis, who's a real gunslinger. He's had some real ups and downs, but he's got top-end potential we saw at USC. Uh, when you look at the schedule here, West Virginia is no slouch, uh, but they'll get that win. Then you have a massive matchup against Tennessee, like I just talked about, at home. I think the balls are much improved, but Pittsburgh, with the home field advantage, gets the win here. Looking further down the schedule, Virginia Tech might be a trap spot here. Uh, they're probably overlooked a bit because of their coaching change, but they do have quite a bit of talent on that squad. The Panthers then have two road tests late at North Carolina and at Miami. Those two will be, if they, if they win those games, those will be kind of primetime evening games. If they win those games, that will really bolster them up into the potential for the college football playoff. I could see them running the table, possibly. Uh, they will likely face a top-10 Clemson or Wake Forest in the ACC championship. 
I think if any one of those teams that I just mentioned finishes the season with just one loss and wins the conference championship, they're likely into the playoff. Um, my next team is Oklahoma State. I think that they could make another run at it this year. They have uh, three three year starters. Spencer Sanders is back at quarterback for the Cowboys. The leading receiver and flat out speedster Tay Martin is also back. Leading rusher Jalen Warren is back in the backfield. They did lose a lot on defense. Uh, and lost their defensive coordinator, Jim Knowles. But the Big 12, I think, is just so wide open with the issues Oklahoma's been having. The first real test for this Oklahoma State squad is at Waco on October 1st. Mike Gundy is really one of the best coaches, I think, that people never really talk about. They have a tough back-to-back at the end of October, uh, but the last month is really pretty tame. Just Bedlam and Norman, but really we have no idea how good Oklahoma will be this year. I think a one-loss Cowboy squad that wins the Big 12 will likely get into the playoff. Next, we have the Utah Utes out of the Pac-12. You may have a dark horse candidate, by the way, in Cam Rising at quarterback. He took a team that started 1-2 and two last year and went 9-2 and two in their last 11 games. He adds a real change of pace with his running ability. The Utes return almost 70% of their production from last year and are a clear preseason Pac-12 champion, in my opinion a full head above your Oregons, your UCLAs, and then maybe people are trying to put USC in that category. They have a strong non-conference schedule uh, that will kind of garner respect nationally playing at Florida. You also have uh, San Diego State at home. San Diego State has been perennially uh, a bottom in top 25 team. At UCLA on October 8th and at Oregon on November 19th are the true tests. These are basically the same teams now with Oregon adding Bo Nix at quarterback. You have high-flying offense, suspect defense, and a very talented QB, but who will make a stupid error at the end of the game to cost them a loss. As you look at their schedule there, I mean, it shapes up for Utah to really make a run at the playoff, but we all know how the Pac-12 is. Utah is probably going to be undefeated and then lose to, like, Stanford or Arizona like they do every year. And then, uh, you know, basically work their way out of a playoff spot. The next question I wanted to address here before I let you go is what are the teams that I view as being kind of a a market drop-off from last year? The first one, and people are going to hate me for this, but is Notre Dame. You got a new head coach, new defensive coordinator in Al Golden. Hey, by the way, Al Golden, your new defensive coordinator, he hasn't even coached since 2015. Complete overhaul of the offense. Your leading rusher the last two seasons in Kyron Williams uh, is gone, as well as, obviously, Jack Cohen at quarterback. Your quarterback is going to be freshman Tyler Buckner, who is replacing Jack Cohen. Uh, He played a little bit last year. They do return the entire offensive line, though, and so that's obviously a positive. On the defensive side, they brought in Brandon Joseph from Northwestern to replace their All-American safety, Kyle Hamilton. But you lose Myron Tagovailoa, Amosa, and Kurt Hinnish, who are big losses on that side of the ball, too. I'd say don't be surprised if Notre Dame loses big in their opener. You see that opening game at Ohio State. Do not be surprised if Ohio State wins that by three or maybe even four touchdowns. I think they're going to cruise in the next two, but then they face a a lot of bounce-back teams on their schedule this year. North Carolina, BYU, Stanford, Boston College. And USC, I think, we're, are all going to be better this year than they were last year. You have that fun game there at Baltimore Ravens Stadium against Navy. Uh, oh, yeah, that's after you play against Clemson on November 5th. And only five true home games, and one of them is Clemson. Yikes. I could even maybe see a motivated USC squad pulling off a win at South Bend at the end of the year. One year after just barely missing the playoff, this Notre Dame squad could seriously go 7-5. and five. So our next team that I see dropping off from what they did last year is Michigan State. Mel Tucker was super active again in the transfer portal. Now, quarterback Peyton Thorne returns, and he will likely have a starting left tackle, Jarrett Horst, back, uh, but he's the only returning O-lineman. Yikes, that's trouble. Uh, Kenneth Walker went pro, so you bring in Jarrett Broussard from Colorado. Jarrett Broussard had a god-awful season last year. He's dealt with some injuries. I'm not entirely sure that that's the weapon they think they're going to get. In addition, you only get 60% of the offensive production back. 
as we look at the schedule here, the game against Washington is going to be no cakewalk. Do not overlook the Huskies week three as they have a much improved defense. You then have a four-game stretch. I could see them easily losing three of Minnesota at Maryland, Ohio State, and Wisconsin. You're then at Michigan and finish the season at Penn State, who will be better than they were last year. I think Ohio State is every bit as strong as any team Ryan Day has coached. I think last year was an aberration, not the reality for Mel Tucker's squad. You can't hit the lottery twice in a row in the transfer portal. Too much turnover. I think you could legitimately see the Sparty squad go 7-5 and five as well. Uh, I will be coming out uh, in the next few weeks probably with my post-spring game uh, power rankings for all 130 FBS football teams. We'll then use those power rankings to apply to the actual scheduled games, see if we can produce uh, team win totals, uh, and then maybe later on in the summer, compare those with Vegas's odds for team win totals, see if we can't identify some value, maybe a spot we can drop some money and see if we can't um, get, a, get a big winning coming our way. But with all that being said, thanks again for checking us out on Right on Q College Sports. I'm your host, Tyson Quiller. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share these videos. Feel free to send me your feedback right on Q College Sports, and we will get at you next time.